Hello and welcome to my analysis of the Nemesis system within Monolith Productions, Middle-Earth, Shadow of Mordor. Throughout this video, I will discuss how the innovative Nemesis system works within game, and how it creates such a distinctive experience for the player. Normally, a video game induces a memorable experience through character customization, narrative and loot systems, whereas in Shadow of Mordor, this is created through the player's enemies. The game's director, Michael DePlater, said, very often, the most memorable villains are not the pre-crafted ones within the story, but the emergent characters who enter the spotlight through a chance encounter. This effect is represented through the Nemesis system. Referred to as Sauron's army within game, it means enemies are generated randomly and act independently from one another. This creates a unique player experience and an overall more immersive experience, because all enemies have names and memories, meaning every confrontation can give birth to a rivalry. First I will look into the Nemesis system display. Within game, this system is displayed as a patriarchal society, accessible through the start menu. This top-down view is reminiscent of a chessboard, the Nemesis themselves representing the pieces in Sauron's army. Sauron himself is king, the war chiefs on plinths signify queens, the toughest of their kind and very versatile through their actions. The remaining Nemesis, known as captains, resemble knights, bishops and rooks, always protective of their queens and king, but want to vie for more power themselves. The new recruits, the most common NPC enemies within game, are pawns. Through great feats they can gain rank themselves. Each nemesis also has a sidebar showing their location and any active quests related to them. Every nemesis also has a range of strengths and weaknesses which can be discovered through interrogating other NPCs. Once discovered, the player can exploit the latter in combat to quickly defeat enemies. This helps encourage players into using caution and tactics when facing enemies, to prepare accordingly rather than running headlong at enemies. Looking more closely at the Nemesis themselves, they are profoundly affected by the player's actions. AI researcher Michael Cook said, I think one of the reasons the system was such a hit with people was that I acknowledge the player's decisions in ways we're not used to. This is evident in game through side quests and previous confrontations with the same Nemesis. The nemesis here references a previous altercation, specifically how the player scarred him. This shows how the nemesis system uses AI to create an artificial social memory between the nemesis and the protagonist. This helps immerse the player because the system acknowledges their actions through dialogue and physical changes in appearance. This makes the enemies themselves seem more than just generic NPCs and instead unique characters that function beyond the player. I will now look at how the nemesis system can develop within game. Upon player death, the player is revived. Replacing the more common death screen is a visual battle report where the system evolves. The enemy that dealt the killing blow, as seen here, was a pawn, and so rises onto the social structure, becoming a more unique character through being given a name and changing appearance. This creates player agency because it means any regular NPC can so easily replace nemeses previously killed by the player. Also, all the other nemeses resolve their quests not completed by the player. The infighting, evident through several resolving quests here, further shows how each nemesis has its own aims and characteristics. This again shows how the world of the game remembers and responds to the character, their lack of interference in the side quests having consequences. This makes player preservation a critical mechanic, because there is no reset or reload, the character has to accept the mistakes they have made creating more realism as they have to learn from their mistakes. The Nemesis system also immerses the player through the systemic nature of grudges and revenge. Revisiting the social structure display, a new icon is visible over the Nemesis that killed the player, highlighting them as a revenge target. As Keith Stewart said, suddenly, retribution isn't just a plot device, it's a game mechanic. Players experience the shame and dishonour for themselves and become the authors of their own revenge fantasies. Based on this, the Nemesis system encourages the player to seek out revenge. This makes the relationship between the player and the Nemesis very personal because the Nemesis becomes the embodiment of a memorable encounter. In comparison, in the Dark Souls series, specifically here in Dark Souls 3, there is a similar feeling of player preservation. When the player dies, as evident here, 
the player is revived. Whereas, unlike in Shadow of Mordor, the world resets, making the player repeat what they have already done. They also lose all of their souls, the form of currency within game. Because of this, in comparison to Shadow of Mordor, the players are encouraged to recover their souls, because dying again causes them to be lost forever. This creates the form of player agency within game, through the fear of dying. Although, in Shadow of Mordor there is a similar fear of dying, the characters are encouraged to seek revenge and the world moves on around them. Overall, the Nemesis system makes Shadow of Mordor a unique experience for the player where the players are empowered to create their own narratives. Monolith Productions have also said that they do not see the Nemesis system as a finished product, that Shadow of Mordor was a test for the Nemesis system and something to learn from and develop from. Overall, I believe that the Nemesis system is an innovative system that will influence the future of gaming, leading to new kinds of games and possibly even a resurgence of the role-playing genre where roles do matter. Thank you for watching.